my name is Lauren Whitehead. I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia and also uh, currently the director of a network of universities called the High Bar Research Alliance. I'm here uh, now to just give a brief presentation regarding High Bar Research. I'll be describing momentarily what that is. Uh, and the reason for this presentation is to uh, help us all prepare for an upcoming workshop on this topic, which I will also describe. So I'm now going to go to a screen sharing mode. And the presentation is entitled Applying the Principles of Highly Integrative, Basic and Responsive High Bar Research for Better Societal Impact. Um, in the workshop that I've mentioned, uh, I'll be uh, co-presenting these ideas with uh, Mark David Seidel, also a professor at the University of British Columbia. So here we go. Uh, here's a, a brief outline for my 20-minute uh, presentation today. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about this idea, high bar research, uh, which has a history of, of profound impact on humankind in a very positive way. Um, and I'd like to explain why high bar research is so impactful. Uh, and then discuss the possibility that we collectively could improve the impact of research by taking advantage of these principles of, of high bar research. Uh, and that's all leading up to the, the workshop um, that we'll be attending together, hopefully with you, which is entitled Harnessing Creative Tensions to Enhance Fundamental Research in Service to Society. So let's begin with high bar research. What is it? Well, it's a time-honored form of research. It's been away for, around for a long time. Then it addresses these challenges. Basically, basic research, which we're all familiar with at universities, is often too disconnected from society, yet applied research, which we also know well, is often too short-term focused. So this is a challenge that needs to be addressed. And high bar research projects integrate, they address that challenge by integrating basic and applied research in key ways that make them more innovative and impactful. So let me expand on, on that idea. First, I'll say or add that um, this is not any one person's idea. It's a collective wisdom, if you like, that has evolved uh, over recent decades um, with numerous experts that have studied this topic very carefully. Um, there is a book uh, dating back to the turn of the century by Donald Stokes at Princeton called Pastor's Quadrant. Many of you may be familiar with this, but he was one of the first people to really cogently identify what we'd all known for a long time, which is the projects that blend basic and applied are very powerful. It can be very, very powerful if done well. Uh, more recently, a book by Ben Schneiderman, uh, The New ABCs of Research, makes this argument very powerfully. Uh, and particularly interested in, as well is a book by Venkatesh Narayana Murray, Murray at, uh, entitled Cycles of Invention and Discovery, um, which particularly highlights an iterative way the projects evolve when they balance invention and discovery that end up being very powerful and gives a first-hand tale of this. And there's a great deal of literature, uh, signed uh, technical and academic literature on this topic. It's a very well-established idea. What's less clear is how we can achieve more of these good things happening. And that's very much the topic for today. I'll just uh, comment that there are really well-known examples of high bar research. It has been around forever, really. Uh, but some famous examples that came from the latter part of, uh, well, the last century, basically, are penicillin, its discovery, uh, the transistor out of Bell Labs, the global positioning system, and the internet itself. All of these things trace back to high bar research projects that were highly impactful. And there are highly impactful high bar research projects happening today. The question is, can we enhance that? So to discuss that, let's be a little bit more precise about what exactly high bar research is. Well, research results, uh, we all know, could be excellent in many different ways, all good. So, for example, um, you know, we can describe research as ranging from highly theoretical, kind of at the, the top region of this diagram, to highly, uh, highly application-oriented at the bottom region. So, they're nice little descriptors that kind of go from one realm to the other. So, this is not a new idea. This idea of there being a spectrum of, of research at universities is well-known and well-understood. But, you know, if we describe research in simpler terms at universities, we often use the words basic and applied. So when people talk about uh, basic research, uh, they're talking about research activities where the individual actions underway tend toward the upper end of this range, the more theoretical, the more long-term uh, end of that range. We kind of all know what that looks like. 
And similarly, um, there are lots of great projects that are very much what you would call applied research, where their activities tend to be much more kind of at the short end, short term end of that range. This is fine, except for a problem. You'll notice that there's a kind of a middle ground here that is underpopulated. And that's kind of an area that needs to be populated, we believe. And that's where high bar, per, pro, high bar research projects are centered. So high bar research is both basic and applied. The width of activities or the, the range of activities within a high bar project can span the entire distance from highly basic to highly applied. And the kind of center of mass is right in this middle zone where, where we're looking at work that provides valuable understanding and also is motivated and informed by societal issues. Uh, and, and in a way, that span gives both power, as, as we'll discuss further, uh, but also it's a way of bridging the world of basic research with the world of applied, which just makes universities stronger. So that's the idea of, of what high bar research is. Uh, but to be more specific, and this is very relevant to our workshop, uh, we'd like to discuss how we can identify research projects as being high bar, and more importantly, how we can improve research projects if they're sort of high bar, but not quite. So to do that, we're going to address these four powerful words, why, how, who, and when. For each of these, uh, there are a couple of attributes that are related that are important to high bar. So under the why, here's the question. Is there an intent to discover new knowledge? Is that why the research is happening? Or is there a desire to solve societal problems? Well, for each one of these categories, I want to replace that word or with the word and. But that, those are the questions about purpose. Regarding, um, and, and if the answer to both those questions is yes, we'll put a tech, tick mark there, and that means this potentially is a high bar project we're talking about. So what about the how? What are the techniques that are used? Well. There's the standard techniques where uh, there's a scholarly, rational approach for doing the work. Uh, and then there are often more creative techniques um, that are more, uh, uh, we call a creative process type technique, more the sorts of things that are used to solve problems quickly in society. Uh, so both of these ways forward are valuable. They're really va especially valuable when they're together. So if the answer to both of these questions is yes, well, then it could be a high bar project. Now, extremely important is the issue of who's doing the work, and especially who's leading the work. So under this who category, questions are, are established basic researchers deeply engaged? And also, just as important, are societal experts who are close to the problem true partner leaders from the start? Again, if the answer is yes to both of those, it's potentially a high bar project. And the last issue here is one of time frame. And the two questions here are, are the participants committed to a long-term effort? Do they understand it's going to be a long haul, probably, to reach the success that's required? But at the same time, is there a plan for maintaining urgency throughout that time? If the answer is yes to both of those time frame questions, then, and if it's yes to all of these questions, then it's a high bar project. At this point in the conversation, People always ask, are all eight of these things essential for it to be a high bar project? Well, that's exactly the point we'd like to discuss. In one sense, you could say, well, there's no black and white to any of this. But there is value in inclusiveness of all of these ideas. And I'll get to that again uh, toward the end of this presentation. But to begin with, I'll just mention that um, there are a lot of people now that are very, very interested in how we can move forward with high bar research. Um, there's actually a, a group of universities called the High Bar Research Alliance, um, listed here, uh, that is dedicated uh, to cooperating uh, to help advance high bar research throughout the university system, ultimately worldwide, obviously in, in cooperation with many partners. Um, and I'd just like to say that uh, you're, everyone's welcome to participate in, in the uh, High Bar Research Alliance, whether or not their own university is part of it, or whether or not they're at a university. Um, and you can learn more about it at the um, address that's shown here for, for their website. And also there's a recent paper, uh, more of an academic paper on all of the details of what high bar research is and what the high bar research Alliance is doing um, at the free link that's given at the bottom of the screen here. So please feel free to have a look there and, um, and learn more about it. But very briefly, and then I'll move on to the, the research itself. The mission of the high bar research Alliance 
is to achieve within 10 years a system-wide fourfold increase in the fraction of university projects that are high bar, from, that is from roughly one project in 20 today to about one in five. And I'm going to show you this in a graphic in a few minutes. Um, while strengthening all other important forms of research. So that's the goal of that group. We believe it's possible, and we believe that it'll be very impactful. So I mentioned a graphic. I'd like to now show you kind of an image. Um, you'll see what it's about in a moment. But basically, this is a Venn diagram that shows the space of university research projects. So if you're involved with the university research project, it's somewhere in this space. Now let me describe the components of this space. So first of all, uh, some research projects, uh, in fact, most research projects at a university are aimed at discovering new knowledge. Not all are, but most are. And so this dotted rec dashed rectangle shows the zone of research projects that are aimed at discovering new knowledge. And now I'm going to show you some overlapping zones. So the second one is, uh, is one where the research projects are aimed at solving societal problems. Majority probably qualify in that way. Uh, but, but there's only some overlap between these two zones. Uh, and then I'll show two more zones. The third one is time horizon. Is the research project a long-term affair? Is it aim, aiming at things that take a long time, but we have the patience and the need to pursue them? So is it long-term research? And the fourth is, uh, are societal experts deep partners in the research? So those are four valuable characteristics you would not expect all four to occur on all projects, and they do not. Uh, but there is a central overlap zone, the white square in the center, that's high bar. So research projects that are in that zone are highly integrative, basic, and responsive. Well, who cares? Well, let's, let's talk about that. We already have the claim and significant research uh, backing up the claim that projects that do have all four of those characteristics are on balance more positively impactful for society. So let's think about how that might look and how the goal of changing the amount of high bar in society could evolve over time. So the stars in this chart just represent research projects at a university, say a random selection of, I don't know, 40 or 50 research projects. And they're in all of these squares and that's fine. Uh, they're all good areas for research to be. Um, but, you know, there's only about one out of 20 in that central high bar zone today. That's, a, that's the best estimate that we have for a research project that have all those good characteristics. Lots of projects, they have lots of good characteristics, but getting them all simultaneously isn't easy. There's some difficulty, and that's really the point of this conversation. And so at the moment, we think there are about one in 20 that are in that zone. So that's 2020. Now I'm going to hit a button on my computer, and we're going to fast forward over 10 years of time to show you the evolution that we believe is possible for high bar research. So the evolution is simply some shifting and some reprioritizing uh, so that actually about one out of five research projects are in that high bar zone. Not a dramatic shocking change for a university, but it could be a very dramatic positive development for impact on society because, and I'll show this symbolically by enlarging the stars in the middle, those stars in the high bar zone, those projects in the high bar zone are very highly impactful. So without radically changing the fabric of the university system, but through partnership with experts outside the system in all the right ways, we have the potential to have dramatically more impact. So that's what we're aiming to do. And the question is, how, how can we have that impact? How might it be possible to encourage this evolution to occur. Well, I'd like to go back to that list of eight things and show you some examples of situations where some might be missing. And I have two in mind, they're both true stories. So the first one is the case of the useful molecule. This is a case where uh, there was a research group that was interested in a molecule and they were interested in very accurately characterizing its shape, which is hard. So it was a very interesting, long-term, important research project. And the reason they were using that molecule is somebody had heard somewhere that that molecule was used in solar cells. Now, they weren't working on solar cells. They had no knowledge of anybody who was working on solar cells. Um, so it, it wasn't that there was a direct connection, but they thought that was worth saying. It was a molecule that they thought could be useful. If you look at the question of why were they doing it, well, there was certainly an intent to discover new knowledge about that molecule. Uh, and 
they did have a desire to solve societal problems. At least they thought that because they were studying a molecule that was used in solar cells, there might be some use there. They had no particular knowledge of it, but at least they had the desire. So both forms of desire for a high bar project were present. Uh, in terms of the how, well, they certainly were following their normal scientific procedure for studying the shapes of molecules. This is difficult stuff, and they were doing it really well. So very much a check mark for the top box. But the bottom box, not so much. There really wasn't anything going on there that had, had a character that was creative. They were turning the crank on a method of analyzing molecules. Going down to the who, uh, certainly the researchers were top notch but they had no connection with anybody that had any use for this molecule. Uh, so there was just no chance that the research would connect with use other than you know, the usual possibility of serendipity. Uh, but there was certainly no directed connection there. So that's a weakness from a high bar perspective. And then certainly the, it was a long-term research project. So that, that was no problem. But in terms of maintaining urgency to urgently solve a problem, there just was no character of that at all. So this is an example of perfectly good university research that's missing some things that would make it high bar. Now, not every project needs to be high bar, but at least it would be worth asking the question, especially because of their claimed interest in solving a societal problem, whether there might be some connection if they actually were involved with people that had uses for molecules of this type to see whether there might be some, some way of adapting the, the project in a way that could fill in some of those other tick marks. So that's an example of, of a way that a project could potentially be improved. The second example, and then I'll be done on this, is uh, the, the case of the special solvent. Now, this is a situation um, where basically uh, a person in, uh, in industry uh, had a problem. The problem was uh, they were a furniture um, uh, uh, renovation company. And part of their work was that they needed to be able to remove old varnish on furniture. Well, they had a product, only one product that was useful for this, and it really worked very, very well. So it wasn't that they, they um, had, had a problem in terms of getting the varnish off old furniture. The problem was the price of the product that they were using. Only one brand that they had found really worked well for their purposes. Um, but they didn't know what was in it, and, um, and it was just insanely expensive. So their business was being crushed by an inability to inexpensively do something they needed to do. Well, it turned out the neighbor uh, person in this business um, worked as a professor in a chemistry department. And so there was an over the fence conversation one time and the conversation led to a, an idea. What if we take some of this very expensive solvent and run it through the friend's mass spectrometer and find out what's in it? And maybe in fact, there are industrially available chemicals that could be inexpensively purchased, thus improving the product the profitability of the manufacturer. So in this case, um, there was no intent to discover new knowledge. Uh, the, the, the solvent already existed, uh, but there was uh, definitely a problem in society. A manufacturer was having a hard time making a profit because a key ingredient for success was too expensive. Um, so you know that's, that's a pretty practical problem. Now, uh, was there a scholarly rationale for the project? No. Uh, was it guided by a use-inspired creative process? No, there was nothing much going on there. So, um, but, you know, it doesn't make it bad. Um, and what about the people involved? Well, um, there certainly was a societal expert involved from the start. Now, you could say there was an established basic researcher, the friend who had the mass spec, who was willing to run a sample of the solvent, but um, he wasn't really involved. He, he was just helping out in a friendly way. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it wasn't that deep engagement. Uh, and uh, th there was no long-term effort in this. It was a short-term question with a short-term answer, um, but there was a plan to do it urgently. This uh, company's survival depended on finding an answer, which, by the way, was found. So it was a perfectly nice interaction. Uh, of course, it could have happened in other ways. It didn't necessarily require a university to participate, but there was a good relationship there, and there was a good solution. Uh, but again, not certainly not high bar research. But you wonder, one wonders if there might be another aspect of this where something really wonderful could have come out of it. For example, with the enterprising effort of that manufacturer um, and a, a different level of interest in the part of the researcher, maybe there could have been a much safer solvent discovered, one that was less dangerous for people to use and perhaps one that was less harmful for the environment. 
Uh, and that might have been a very interesting long-term project that could have grown out of something like this. So again, by looking at the blanks that sort of separate something from a high bar project, it might be possible to improve it. So if these are just ideas. Uh, they're ideas that we very much want to explore in our workshop. So in the workshop, um, here's what will happen. First of all, we're gonna look at this idea of a high bar checklist or some variant of it. You may have other ideas for how to approach this, but where the goal is to be able to help enhance research for impact. Uh, and specifically, how can we aim to have projects that are more hybridized uh, in order to achieve that? Really, um, with what we learned from that, we'd also love to discuss how to generalize and disseminate this approach for enhancing research impact. So uh, that summarizes my presentation now, and we are very much looking forward to seeing you shortly. Uh, Mark David Seidel and I will look forward to your participation in this upcoming workshop. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.